For as long as we've been human, the longing to walk over new horizons has been with us. We just love visiting new places. Homo sapiens evolved in Africa about 200,000 years ago, and there we stayed for 100,000 years, give or take, until a small band of explorers walked north into the Middle East. By 50,000 years ago, we'd walked through India, South Asia, and down into Australia. Meanwhile, a few of us headed north into Europe and the rest of Asia. And about 15,000 years ago, we walked into North America over what was then a land bridge between Alaska and Russia. And by 12,000 years ago, we'd walked all the way through Central America down to the southern tip of South America. But it wouldn't be until practically yesterday that we explored the entire planet. That would come in 1911, when we reached the bottom of the globe and we left footprints and a tent and a Norwegian flag on the South Pole. That was it. There was and remains no new land to explore. But that itch, that desire to visit new places is still inside us. And with no new horizons to go over, in the mid-1900s we set our sights above and beyond the horizon, into outer space. First stop, the moon. There's just, I don't know, something about the moon. There's a kind of magnetism. It's graced the sky forever and it's influenced our finest art and our culture for millennia. It pulls our imagination just like the tide. And as our closest celestial neighbour, it's the easiest one to get to. So, how many times have we been to the moon? The answer might surprise you. There's far more to lunar exploration than just the Apollo missions. Now, my definition of being there in this video is quite loose. I'm including all of the robotic landers too, including the ones that crashed, both accidentally and intentionally. The moon is quarter of a million miles from the Earth. Even an accidental crash land is still quite an impressive feat of engineering. These touchdowns represent one of the most amazing journeys humanity has ever been on. And a good place to start is the first decade of the 17th century. Somnium, which is Latin for the dream, was one of the earliest works of science fiction, and it was written by one of the foremost astronomers of the scientific revolution, Johannes Kepler, who's famous for his three laws of planetary motion. In Somnium, which you can still buy on Amazon, by the way, Kepler painted a vivid picture of what it was like on the lunar surface, but it wouldn't be until 1959, more than three centuries after Kepler's death, until we went there for real. Cementing an early lead in the space race, the USSR sent their unwieldy-looking Lunar 2 space probe to the moon in 1959. Although it was an intentional crash, it was the first ever human-made object to touch the surface of another world, which is all the more impressive when you consider that it was just 40 years after the first transatlantic flight. And just before it crashed, Luna 2 released two football-sized spheres made from titanium hexagons. Each hexagon read in Cyrillic, USSR, January 1959. Those hexagons will survive on the moon's surface for at least the next billion years. They're humanity's first extraterrestrial, I was here, or I guess rather, the communists were here. America soon caught up though, and in April 1962, Ranger 4 left the launch pad, headed straight for the moon. It was supposed to take measurements and photographs before intentionally crashing into the moon's surface, but it actually ended up just crashing. But it did at least hit the target, and so that definitely still counts. Ranger 6 met a similar end in 1964, but Ranger 7 in the same year took more than 4,000 photographs before it crash landed, giving us our best view yet of the pockmarked lunar surface. The Americans wanted really good photographs of the moon to help them find the landing sites of the Apollo missions, and in 1965 they did the same thing with Ranger 8 and Ranger 9, which took beautiful photographs before they crash landed. In the same year, the Soviets were aiming for a soft landing, but they actually just unintentionally crashed Luna 5, 7 and 8 into the surface. Oops. But then Luna 9 actually made it in February 1966. Success at last! This was the first time humanity had landed on the surface of the moon. And it was the first time we'd taken a photograph from down there too. This is it. In fact, this is the first ever photograph taken from the surface of another world. Luna 9 snapped, developed, scanned and beamed a whole album back to Earth, which confirmed the non-dairy nature of the lunar surface once and for all. It also put the Soviets even further ahead than the Americans in the space race. But the Americans soon caught up when they soft landed Surveyor 1 on the surface and took thousands of high-res photos. Three months later, the Americans accidentally crashed Surveyor 2 into the surface of the moon, and the month after that, they intentionally crashed the Lunar Orbiter 1 into the surface of the moon, but not before it took this beautiful photograph. And to round off a very busy 1966, the Soviets successfully landed Lunar 13 on the surface in December of that year. 1967 would be America's year. Surveyor 3 touched down in April, but 
Who took this photograph and how, you might reasonably ask. We'll get back to that shortly. Surveyor 4 was next, which crash landed into the moon by accident, but Surveyor 5 and Surveyor 6 more than made up for it by measuring the composition of the lunar surface with onboard chemistry kits after flawless landings. In January 68, the American soft landed Surveyor 7, but it was really the year after that was the real deal. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins left the launch pad aboard a Saturn V rocket, traversed more than quarter of a million miles through space, and four days Years later, touch down softly on the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. America won the space race, hands down. They left various bits of science paraphernalia on the surface, a flag, of course, and crucially, footprints. Humanity was, at last, an interplanetary species. We've come a long way since we left Africa a hundred thousand years ago. Kepler would have been proud. On the same day that Apollo 11 landed, in fact, while Neil and Buzz were still on the surface, the Soviets attempted to soft land Luna 15. But their obvious attempt to steal Apollo's thunder and gate crash what was definitely the best party in the solar system failed miserably. Luna 15 crashed. That's embarrassing, but it still counts as a landing. Next came Apollo 12, another triumph of human ingenuity, which blasted off the launch pad in November 1969. And in what I think is definitely the best space mission crossover of all time, the Apollo 12 astronauts visited the landing site of Surveyor 3 that had touched down a few years previously. They found the lander intact, and looking better than ever. In April 1970 came Apollo 13, which famously never made it to the lunar surface after an oxygen tank exploded en route. Houston, we have a problem. But the crew did release the third stage of their Saturn V rocket, which intentionally crashed into the moon, which by my rules still counts. A few months later, the Soviets soft landed Luna 16, which scooped up rocks and brought them back to the Earth robotically. And a few months later, the Soviets soft landed Luna 17, which carried with it the first ever moon rover. The Americans kicked off 1971 with Apollo 14, which I think the astronauts made look way too easy by having time to play golf on the surface. And if golf wasn't cool enough, Apollo 15 took a moon buggy with them that they used to row far and wide across the moon's surface. In September 1971, the Soviets intentionally crashed Lunar 18 into the moon. And in February 1972, they did another successful sample return with Lunar 20, which picked up moon rocks and brought them back to the Earth. A few months after Lunar 20, Apollo 16 touched down on the surface of the moon and spent a couple of days there. And then in December 1972, Apollo 17 made it to the surface and spent a record three days and three hours there. The astronauts did science experiments, they drove almost five miles in their lunar buggy, and they packed up 115 kilograms of moon rocks. In total, the Apollo astronauts brought 381 kilograms of moon rocks back to the Earth. These samples, picked apart by chemists and geologists in labs, completely transformed our understanding of the moon. Now, Apollo 17 was the last time somebody visited the moon, and it was more than half a century ago. It was closer in time to Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin or the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II than it is to today. No human has travelled beyond low earth orbit since 1972. And I'm not saying that low earth orbit isn't cool. It is. But it's not the moon. I think it's about time we go back. Anyway, there was just one landing in 1973, the USSR's Luna 21, which released a rover. You can see the tracks on this pano. And there was just one landing the year after, the USSR's Luna 23, which just about managed to soft land. It did hit harder than expected, and so never brought back any samples as planned. The site of the almost crash was later spotted by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And then it would be two whole years until we went back. The USSR's Luna 24 soft landed. It drilled picked up samples and brought them back to Earth. And then, nobody returned to the moon for 14 years, which was the longest unbroken spell since we started going there in 1959. But then in 1990, the hiatus was broken by Japan. It put its hit and probe into a highly elliptical Earth orbit. It swung around the moon 10 times before intentionally crashing into the surface. Nine years later, after mapping the surface composition from orbit, making maps like this Thorium map, NASA's Lunar Prospector was intentionally crashed into the moon. 2006 saw the European Space Agency's first landing, albeit a crash landing, but thankfully intentional, with its small mission for advanced research technology one, or smart one for short. <sighs> The people who name spacecraft really love a good backronym. Smart One was the first European space mission to reach the moon, which I guess is better late than never. 2008 saw India's debut moon mission with its Chandrayaan-1 space probe. From orbit, Chandrayaan-1 mapped the tiny amount of water locked up on the moon's surface, and then it fired a small probe into the surface of the moon, releasing a plume in which water was detected. In February 2009, Japan intentionally crashed the Akina space probe into the moon. Akina was carried by the Kaguya spacecraft, 
craft, which, after 20 years of mapping the lunar topography from orbit, joined its little brother on the lunar surface with a crash landing. A few months later, China had its lunar debut with Chang'e 1, named after the goddess of the moon, which intentionally crashed into the surface after 15 months in orbit. A few months later, NASA intentionally crashed into the surface of the moon with its Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, or La Crosse for short. The upper stage of La Crosse blasted 350 tons of rock into the lunar sky, and minutes later, a second probe called the Shepherding Satellite flew through the plume and detected water, which is a tantalising prospect when we think about human habitation. The Shepherding Satellite crashed six minutes later at five and a half thousand miles per hour. And then nothing happened until 2013 when China landed Chang'e 3. It was the first soft landing since the USSR's Luna 24 in 1976, which broke a 37 year hiatus in surface exploration. And soon after landing, it released this cute little rover called U2. Aww. And then nothing again until 2019 when China landed Chang'e 4 on the far side of the moon. And just like its predecessor, Chang'e 4 released another sweet little rover, this one called U22. Aww. Very sweet. Later in the same year, Israel saw its lunar debut with the Bereshit mission. As well as being Israel's first moon mission, it was the first ever attempted by a private company, as opposed to a national space organisation. And I say attempted because Bereshit crash landed, leaving behind a miniature crater later spotted by NASA's lunar reconnaissance. Orbiter. India rounded off 2019 with its Chandrayaan 2 mission, which consisted of a lunar orbiter and a lander named Vikram. But Vikram was never destined to make it to the surface. It crashed because of a software glitch. The only thing to land in 2020 was China's Chang'e 5 lander, which touched down softly and collected almost two kilograms of rocks, including surface sweepings and a one meter long drill core. It carried the payload back to Earth, making it the first sample return since 1976. 2023 saw another privately funded space mission, this time from Japan. Hakuto R Mission 1 was to soft land on the moon, but it crashed after communications were lost. And the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter later found the crater. In August 2023, Russia accidentally crash landed Luna 25 on the surface. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter again found the crash site. That thing spies everything. No crashed spacecraft goes unnoticed these days. In the same month, India became the first nation to soft land on the lunar south pole with Chandrayaan 3. It survived for 12 days before the bitterly cold lunar nighttime killed it off. In January 2024, Japan successfully landed its smart lander for investigating moon probe. It survived a whopping three lunar night times, which is really impressive when you consider that each one lasts for about two weeks. And of course, it was snapped from upon high by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. A month later, the first ever private company successfully landed on the surface of the moon. America's IM-1, named after the company that made it happen, Intuitive Machines, successfully touched down on the surface. It lasted for a week before the lunar night killed it off, and it was the first time America had soft landed on the moon since since Apollo 17 in 1972. And here are the obligatory before and after snaps by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And finally, we reach the end of the story so far with China's Chang'e 6 mission, which landed on the far side of the moon in June 2024. It scooped up almost two kilograms of moon rocks, the first ever collected from the lunar far side, and returned them to Earth safely a couple of weeks later. And so, that's it. Six crewed Apollo missions, 20 robotic soft landings, 11 accidental crashes, and 17 intentional crashes. We've been to the moon 54 times, depending on how you count it. So... What's next? There are a couple of landers at various stages of development along the lines of previous landers, but all eyes really are on getting humans back to the moon. NASA's Artemis program aims to do just that. In 2022, they launched Artemis 1, an uncrewed rocket which swung by the moon before coming back to the Earth. It took with it a capsule designed to carry astronauts and even had a rehearsal splash landing in the Pacific Ocean. Artemis 2, which plans to put humans in orbit around the moon, is scheduled for 2025, and Artemis 3, which will land them on the lunar south pole, is due for 2026. Which to me seems, I don't know, a bit ambitious, maybe a bit overly optimistic. I'm not sure it will happen, but I hope that I'm proved wrong. Meanwhile, China plans to put people on the moon by 2030 and has even revealed the snazzy spacesuit that its astronauts will wear. Although I don't think they look as cool as the Apollo spacesuits. Whilst China has done a really good job soft landing its Changi probes on the surface, sending humans there and bringing them back safely is a whole different kettle of fish. But we'll see. I was born far too late to see the Apollo heyday, but I do believe that a alive and amongst us today is the next person to set foot on the moon. And it'll be about time.